in our suspension of reality, I want you all to pretend that we are all African Americans. Hmm. Assalamu alaikum. And during the few moments that we have left, <clears throat> we would just like to have an off the cuff chat between you and me, us. We like to talk right down to earth, a uh, language that everyone here can easily understand. We all agree, all of the speakers on this series agree that America has a very serious problem. Not only does America have a very serious problem, but our people have a very serious problem. America's problem is us. We are her problem. And the only reason that she has a problem is that she doesn't want us here. And every time you look at yourself, be you black, brown, red, or yellow, a so-called Negro. You represent a person who poses such a serious problem for America simply because you're not wanted. And once we began to face this as a fact, we can begin to chart a course that will make us appear intelligent instead of unintelligent. Now what you and I must learn to do is to forget our differences. When we come together, we don't come together as Baptists or Methodists. You don't catch hell because you're a Baptist. You don't catch hell because you're a Methodist. You don't catch hell because you're a Baptist or a Methodist. You don't catch hell because you're a Mason, Democrat, Republican or an elk, and you sure don't catch hell because you are an American, because if you were an American, you wouldn't catch no hell. You catch hell because you're a black man. You catch hell. All of us catch hell for the same reason. So we all black people, so-called Negroes, second-class citizens, ex-slaves. You're nothing but an ex-slave. You don't like to be told that, but what else are you? You an ex-slave. You didn't come here on the Mayflower. You were brought here in chains like a horse or a cow or a chicken. And you were brought here by the people who came over on the Mayflower. You were brought here by the pilgrims or so-called founding fathers. They were the ones who brought you here and shot you full of Novocaine. Like when you go to the dentist and he's going to take your tooth, what you do? You start fighting when he starts pulling. So to keep you from fighting back, they squirt some stuff in your jaw they call Novocaine to make you think they aren't doing anything to you. And because you got all of this Novocaine shot up in you, you sit there and you suffer peacefully. Blood running all down your jaw, see, but you don't know what's happening, see, because somebody has taught you to suffer peacefully. Don't stop suffering. Just suffer peacefully. As Reverend Cleed pointed out, let your blood flow in the streets. This is a shame. Hmm. And he's a Christian preacher. If it's a shame to him, you know what it is to me. And there's nothing in our religious book, the Koran as you call it, Koran, that teaches us to suffer peacefully. Our religion teaches us to be peaceful, obey the law, respect every man. But if someone puts his hands on you, send him to the cemetery. And that's a good religion. In fact, that's that old time religion. 
That's the one that Ma and Paul used to talk about. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a head for a head and a life for a life and nobody. Nobody resents that type of religion being taught except a wolf who intends to make you his next meal. And these old religious Uncle Toms running around here talking about give up your life for freedom? No, brothers and sisters, you preserve your life because it's the best thing you got. And if you must give it up, I say if you must give it up, let it be even Stephen. My earliest recollection as a being snatched awake in the middle of the night because our house was on fire. My mother was a West Indian from Grenada and my father a militant Baptist minister and follower of Marcus Garvey preached race pride and separation from the white man. The Lansing, Michigan arm of the Ku Klux Klan wanted him to stop preaching Garvey's message, but my father was not to frighten Negro and he kept on. Next thing, he was found with his head bashed in, lying across the streetcar tracks. A trolley had almost cut him in half. After my father's death, my mother tried to hold the family together. She couldn't find work because the Christian people of Lansing wouldn't hide a widow of a crazy nigger. But she could stretch bread a dozen ways. Fired bread and stewed bread and when she found raisins bread pudding. When there was no bread, she fed us dandelions, fried grass. We were so hungry, we were dizzy. We stole to stay alive. It was too much for her, so they put her away in a mental institution and parceled out us kids to reform schools, charities, and homes. When you live in a poor neighborhood, you're living in an area where you have poor schools. When you have poor schools, you have poor teachers. When you have poor teachers, you get a poor education. Poor education, you can only work on a poor paying job. And that poor paying job will enable you to live again in a poor neighborhood. So it's a very visual cycle. I'll never forget the man who taught me English in the eighth grade. He told us that thing about what we wanted to be. I said, I wanted to become a lawyer. He said, you need to think about something you can be like a carpenter. You got good grades, Malcolm, and people like you, but a lawyer is not a realistic goal for you, Malcolm, and you got to be realistic. You're a nigger. In Roxbury and... Boston, Massachusetts. I got my first job at the Roseland Dance Hall Shining Shoes. And on the side, I sold liquor, reefers, and women. Got my first conk laid on. Got me a sharp zoot suit and I used to jitterbug and party all day and I stayed high all night got me a white chick and I ran with the gamblers and the pimps. To stay out of the draft during World War II, I put on a show like I was crazy. I told the army psychiatrist, I want to join. I want to join up. I want to join the Japanese army. I can't wait to get my hands on me some guns so I can shoot me up a lot of crackers. I got my full F. New York was heaven and Harlem was seventh heaven. Five medics on Lenox Avenue and I had started on my life of crime. We sometimes hear, wonder, a lot of talk about the South. 
And we wonder, why should us here in upstate America worry about what happens in the South? Well, first of all, you got to realize that it's not really the South. South, as long as you south of the Canadian border, you south. <laughs> if one room in your house is dirty, then you got a dirty house. If the kitchen is dirty, you got a dirty house. So don't be saying that this room is dirty, but the rest of my house is clean. You over the whole house. The entire house is under your jurisdiction. And the mistake that you and I make is letting these northern crackers shift away to the southern crackers. Now, I don't mean to be standing here saying things that you didn't think I was going to say. But don't ever, ever call me up here to talk about the south. Because it's controlled right up here in the north. Alabama is controlled from the north. Mississippi is controlled from the north. These northern crackers are in cahoots with the southern crackers, only these northern crackers will smile in your face and show their teeth and they stick the knife in your back when you turn around. You at least know what that man down there is doing and you know how to deal with it. So all I say is this. This is all I say. Whenever you start talking about the one, then talk about the other. Whenever you start worrying about the part or the piece, then worry about the whole. And if that part is no good and that piece is no good, then the whole pie is no good. Because it all comes from the same plate. It's all made up from the same ingredients. I was into everything the white police and gangsters left over for the black criminal. I was into numbers bootleg liquor, women, dope. I sold the bodies of white women to black men and black women to white men. I steered white people from downtown to whatever kind of sin they wanted in Harlem. And I'll tell you one thing, my best customers was always the officials, top police, businessmen, clergymen, Despite the fact that my own father was murdered by whites, I was sick enough to mix and socialize with them. In fact, I considered them to be gods and goddesses. I was caught when I was 21 and sentenced to 10 years in prison. That's when I first heard the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and they turned me around because there was something about the statement, the white man is the devil, that just clicked. It explained everything. It hit me like a blinding light and I fell on my knees and pledged to Allah that I would tell the black man the true teachings of Islam and the white man the truth about his crimes. We also hear a lot of talk about Africa, East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, South Africa. And we sometimes wonder why should we who have been separated from the African continent for three or four hundred years worry about what happens in Africa. Well, first of all, you got to realize that prior to 1954, Africa was controlled by the colonial powers. The colonial powers of Europe, having complete control over Africa, always projected the image of Africa how? Negatively. They always projected Africa as jungles, cannibals, nothing civilized. Well, then naturally it was so negative that it became negative to you and to me. And we began to hate it. And in hating Africa and hating things African, we ended up hating ourselves without even realizing it. Because you can't hate the roots of a tree and not hate the tree. You can't hate Africa and not hate yourself. 
Now you show me one of these brainwashed Negroes over here who has a negative attitude toward Africa, and I'll show you one who has a negative attitude toward himself. You can't have a negative attitude toward Africa and a positive attitude toward yourself at the same time. To the same degree that your understanding of and appreciation towards Africa becomes positive, you'll also find that your understanding of and appreciation towards yourself will also become positive, and this is what the white man knows. So they very skillfully make you and me hate our African features and our African characteristics, and you know yourself we have been a people who have hated our African features. Oh, yes, we have. We hated our hair, hated our lips, hated our noses. We wanted one of them long dog-like noses, you know. And hating the blood of Africa that was within our veins, we began to feel helpless. We began to feel inadequate. We began to feel as though it was holding us back. It wouldn't let us go this way or that way. And when we fell victim to this feeling of helplessness and inadequacy, we turned to someone else to show us the way. We didn't have confidence in a black folk or a black man to show us the way. In those days, we didn't. We didn't think that a black man could do anything except play some horn, you know, dribble a ball up and down a court. But in serious business where our food, our clothing, our shelter, our education were concerned, we turned to the man. Why? Because we felt helpless. What made us feel helpless was our hatred for ourselves, and our hatred for ourselves stemmed from our hatred of things African. Yes, sir. Hodge, well, I've always had the name Hodge, only I've only used it in the Muslim world. Well, Hodge is a name that's given to anyone who makes the pilgrimage to Mecca during the official hard season. At Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, I remembered the ancient words of Allah to claim the pilgrimage among men. They will come on foot and upon lean camel. They will come from every deep ravine. From Mecca, the holy city of Islam, I wrote to friends in America, never have I witnessed such sincere hospitality and true brotherhood as has been shown me here in this ancient holy city, the home of Abraham, Muhammad, and all of the other prophets from the Holy Scripture. You may be shocked at these words coming from me, but what I have seen has forced me to rearrange many of my previous convictions, to toss aside many of my conclusions previously held. But during the past seven days, I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same cup, slept on the same rug and prayed to the same God as fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. We were truly the same because their belief in one God has erased the white from their mind, the white from their action, and the white from their attitude. Wearing the Irem garb of a pilgrim, I made the seven circuits around the Kaaba. I drank from the sacred wells of Zimzim and ran back and forth seven times between the hills of Mount Al-Safa and Al-Bana. I stood on Mount Abarat and with my brothers proclaimed, I come, O Lord, in peace. 
and for the first time in my 25 by 39 years, I stood before the, the creator of all and felt like a complete human being. Sincerely, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X. Well, my going into the Muslim world, into the African world, and being accepted as an African and as a Muslim may have solved my problem personally, but I feel that my personal problem will never be solved until the plight of black people in this country are solved. So I will remain Malcolm X as long as there's a need to struggle and protest and fight against the injustices that continue to plague black people in this country. Now, we will work with anyone nonviolently, as long as the enemy is nonviolent, but violent when the enemy gets violent. We'll work with you on your uh, school boycotts. We'll work with you on your voter registration drives. Of course, now, I don't believe in any type of integration, at least not the type you're talking about. I don't believe in it, see, because you're not going to get it know-how. Well, you're not going to get it because you are afraid to die. And you've got to be willing to die if you try and force yourself on the white man. Because he will get just as violent as those crackers in Mississippi right here in Boston. But we'll work with you because we are against a segregated school system. A segregated school system produces children when they graduate, graduate with crippled minds. But it doesn't mean that a school system is segregated because it's all black. Look, the white man controls his own school system, his own political system, his own economic system, but he also controls yours. And whenever you're under somebody else's control, you segregate it because they will always give you the worst or the lowest that is to offer. But it doesn't mean that you segregate it because you have your own. You got to control your own. And just like he has control over his, you got to have control over yours. You know, the white man is more afraid of separation than he is of integration. Now, segregation means he puts you away from him, but not so far away he doesn't have you totally within his power. Separation means that you're gone, and the white man will integrate faster than he will let you separate. So we will work with you because we are against a segregated school system because it's criminal because it's destructive in every way imaginable to the minds of children who have to be exposed to that type of crippling education. Hmm. Now, to uh, understand this last point, you got to go back to what <clears throat> the young brother here referred to as a difference between the house Negro and the field Negro. You know, back during slavery, you had two types of Negroes. You had the house Negro, and they lived in the house. And they ate pretty good, because they ate the master's food, what he left. But still, they lived in the basement of the attic, and they lived near the master, and they loved the master more than the master loved himself. Master would come to that house Negro, and he said, hey, Tom, he said, we got a good house here. Oh, Tom would say, yeah, boss, we got a good house here. Every time the master said we, he said we. That's how you can tell a house Negro. Master gets sick, that house Negro said, uh, what's the matter, boss? Are uh, uh, we sick? We sick. He identified with his master more than his master identified with himself. And if you come to that house Negro, and you say, let's run away, let's escape. He look at you like you were crazy. What you mean? Where can I have a better master than I have here? Where can I live in a better house than I have here? That was that house, Negro. 
Only back in them days, they called them what they were, house niggas. And that's what we call them today because we still got some house niggas running around here. This modern day house negro, he loves his master. He wants to lay a nin. He'll pay three times as much as the house is worth just to live near the master and then brag about, uh, I'm the only one out here. I'm the only one on this job. You nothing but a house negro. And if somebody comes to you today, you said the same thing that the house negro said in the plantation. Well, what you mean, leave America? I ain't left nothing in Africa. You left your mind in Africa. But on that same plantation, there were another group of Negroes, field Negroes. See, there were always more Negroes in the fields than there were Negroes in the house. Those Negroes in the house ate high up on the hog. Those Negroes in the fields ate what was left from the insides of the hogs. They call them chitlin nowadays. Back then, they call them what they were, guts. That's what you were, gut eaters. Some of you are still gut eaters. And this field negro was beaten from sun up to sun down, and he hated the master. I say he hated the master. He was intelligent. Master's house catch on fire. That field negro didn't help put it out. He prayed for a wind, <laughs> for a breeze. Master got sick. That field negro hoped that he died. And if you come to that field negro and said, let's run away, he didn't say where we're going. He said, any place is better than here. And you got some field negroes in America today. The masses of field negroes. I'm a field negro. You don't hear these little negroes running around here talking about our government is in trouble. They said the government is in trouble. Imagine a negro talking about our government our army, our navy. I even heard one say the other day, our astronauts. They won't even let him near the plant, but our astronauts. That's a Negro that is out of his mind. That's out of his mind. So in closing, I would just like to say that we all have the same goals, the same objectives, freedom, justice, equality, and respect as human beings. We don't want to be integrationists, nor do we wish to be separationists. Just freedom, justice, equality, and respect as human beings. And in the racial climate of this country, it is anybody's guess which of these extremes and approach might meet the fatal catastrophic end first, non-violent Dr. King, a so-called violent me. To think about dying really doesn't disturb me as it might some people. I've never really felt as though I would live to become an old man. My father and most of his brothers died by violence. My father, because of what he believed in. And when you come right down to it, and you can't take the belief that I have, plus the type of temperament that I have, and the 100% dedication that I have to whatever I believe in, well, these are ingredients which make it just about impossible for me to die of old age. I think it would be almost impossible to find anywhere in America a black man who's lived further down in the mud of human society than I have, or a black man who's been any more ignorant than I have, a one who's suffered greater anguish than I have. But it is only after extreme grief that the greatest joy can come. It is only after experiencing darkness that the greatest appreciation of light can come, and it is only after slavery and prison that the greatest appreciation of freedom can come, and for the freedom of my 22 million black brothers and sisters, I do believe that I have struggled and fought 
the best that I know how and the best that I could with the shortcomings I have, and my shortcomings are many. My greatest lack, I believe, is that I don't have the type of academic education I wish I'd been able to get, to have been a lawyer, perhaps. I do believe that I would have made a good lawyer, as I've always loved verbal battle and challenge. And you can believe me that if I had the time, I would not be one bit ashamed to go back into any New York City public school and begin in the ninth grade where I left off because I don't begin to be academically equipped for so many of the interests that I have. For instance, I love languages. I don't know anything more frustrating than to be around somebody speaking something you don't understand. Especially when they are people who look just like you do. When I was in Africa, I heard original mother tongues such as Hausa and Swahili being spoken. And there I was standing around like some little boy waiting for someone to tell me what had been said. I'll never forget how ignorant I felt. Aside from the basic African dialects, I believe that I would study Chinese because it looks as if Chinese will be the most powerful political language of the future, and already I've begun studying Arabic, which I think will be the most powerful spiritual language of the future. I would just like to study. I mean, range and study, because I have a wide open mind and I'm interested in almost any subject you can mention. I think this is why I've come to like, as individuals, some of the host of radio and television pound programs I've been on, people like uh, Barry Farber and Mike Wallace in New York, people like them. Because even if they have been in constant disagreement with me over the race issue, They've nevertheless managed to keep their minds open about certain truths that are happening in the world today, and they let me know they respected my mind in ways I know they never realized it. The way I know it is that often after a program, well, we would sit around and talk for an hour or so, and they would often invite my opinion over various issues. You see, most white men, even if they do credit a black man with some intelligence, still feels that the only issue that he's qualified to speak on is the race issue. You just notice how often you will ever hear a white man asking a black man, what do you think about the problems of world health or the race to put a man on the moon? Anyway, I live each day now as if I'm already dead. I say it like that because from the things that I know, I do not expect to live long enough to read my autobiography in its finished form. But when I am dead, I would just like for you to wait and see if I'm not right in what I say. That the white man in his press will make use of me dead just as he has made use of me while alive as a convenient symbol of hatred. And this will help him to escape facing the truth that all I have been doing is holding up a mirror to reflect, to show the history of unspeakable crimes that his race has committed against my race. Yes, I have cherished my demagogue role. <laughs> and I know that societies have often killed those who have helped to change those societies. But if I can die having brought any truth, having spread any ray of light that will help to destroy the racist cancer that is malignant in the body of America, and all the credit is due to Allah. 
Only the mistakes have been mine. Thank you.